Hello YouTube, it's Das Gregor, and welcome to what I hope is going to be a very informative and great tutorial that will help you understand the installation of Gentoo, but not just going through the motions, but understand the whole process. This has taken me a long time to decide how I'm going to do this because truthfully there are some Gen 2 tutorials out there how to install and they do it within 20 to 30 minutes and do a great job. It's pretty much just boom boom this is how you do it. But the thing about Gen 2 is it's a system that if you really want to know how Linux works, how, what it looks like under the hood, then this is the best OS in the world to look at and just to kind of throw it on there and just go for it you're gonna miss out on a lot of information so this first parts just mainly gonna be getting the installation media setting everything up and let's just go forward now if you go to www.gen2.org you're gonna to get to all the documentation and resources that you're going to need to do this now first off the Gen 2 handbook is the absolute greatest resource you can ever look for and if we click on that I've already opened a lot of these up because I have so many internet problems with this laptop I need a new laptop maybe Santa will send me one for Christmas we'll see but the network on this thing is horrible so you click on it here and this brings you up to this spot here which should be been up should have been up there and from here you can come on down and you can see view the handbook and you can choose what works best for you you've got the latest version one page per chapter perfect for online viewing it may say that but personally I prefer to have the whole thing all in one page so I can scroll up and down and all that and not have to worry about bouncing back and forth between pages and then here's a printer friendly version but I'll warn you this is a huge handbook and if you want to print it you're going to end up using a lot of paper unless you're wanting to print it to a PDF file for future reference so I've clicked on the AMD 64 because that's what we'll be working at and looking at all in one page which brings up this right here which has all the chapter headings up above and as you can see you know we're gonna go through most all of these to install the system I'm gonna be just kinda going through it with you and hopefully it's not too boring at the end of everything you should be able to understand Gen 2 you should be able to understand what they're trying to do for you and you should feel comfortable building a Gen 2 system now as a caveat I've been using Gen 2 for probably a decade or more off and on and it's been my ultimate OS for at least the last eight or nine years that being said I still go to the handbook and to the installation resources on a regular basis these aren't something that you're going to just learn and understand and immediately pick up on because you're always going to forget these little things. You know, just like a couple months ago, me having to install Gen 2 again because I blew up the partitioning with a bad power drain junkie thing that just ruined me completely. And I had to start all over because my backup wasn't really good so I'm constantly coming to these resources as well now if you're the type of person that says handbook instruction manual what you talking about I don't use no handbook I just want to get in there and do this thing well Gen 2 has created an instruction for you as well if you go to this main page here and you go to docs right here that brings you to this page here and if you scroll down just a little bit you'll see installation related resources and if you click on that you will see that right here there is the handbook and there is also the Gen 2 Linux x86 quick install guide this is only one to two pages maybe three at the most and it gives you the nitty-gritty just what you need to know to make it all work and 
that is right here and as you can see it's yeah I think if you print this out it's no more than three pages might be four yeah, but it's all very simple very easy to go through it's not going to explain a lot it's just going to tell you what you need to do to install it and that is the best resource if you just want to get in there and do it now the last thing is you need to get your installation media and you can click on downloads on the main page right here which will take you to this section right here installation media now there are a couple of things that you can do you can get just a minimal installation or they also have live DVDs now unfortunately when you look at the live DVDs you'll notice that the latest thing that they did was almost a full year ago and maybe they'll come out in the next couple days since it's been a year with a new Gen 2 13 for the end of 2013 which would be great because a live DVD can really help you out if you're not sure what you're getting into but for right now this is over a year old so we're not going to even look at that we're going to mainly just go to the AMD 64 ISO section click on that which brings up our index here and what you want to what you're going to want to download is the install AMD 64 minimal 2013 1010 ISO I've already clicked on that it's very small it's only 228 megs I've clicked on it made my information if you're interested in making sure that you have the something with without <clears throat> excuse me without errors you can look at the digests and get the information that you can do to do a MD5 checksum that sort of thing for the most part I've always had good luck with these ISOs here you'll also notice that our stage 3 tarball is in this and we're not going to be getting that just yet we'll actually be grabbing it once we set up the network inside the Linux system so without further ado what I have done here is I have my little notepad with things that I want to discuss to make sure I bring up up here I've got my instructions right here so we're gonna go back over here to the to the handbook and we're going to be installing this in a virtual box so I have created a Gen 2 new build i have given it 64 megs of video RAM 3 gigs of my RAM um, six processors so hopefully we'll have enough juice so that we don't have to wait too long for some of the information I have set it up so that the DVD is, in, is going to boot from that install AMD 64 minimal ISO and I've created a 20 gig partition so that we can start with that uh, we just go ahead and bring that up and blow that away just hit enter for now and that's gonna bring up this section here now while that loads we're just gonna kinda gradually go through this yeah there is great information about what the purpose of Gen 2 is what they're trying to do you know they're trying to create a fast modern meta distribution with a clean and flexible design that's the greatest thing about Gen 2 Gen 2 can be as elaborate as you want it to be or it can be as small and minimal as you need it to be I have it running on everything from my Raspberry Pi upstairs to my main laptop and in the past I've had it run my servers and everything else because I can put just what I need I don't need a GUI interface so I run everything command line for instance on the Raspberry Pi it houses my Apache servers my streaming audio servers I am trying to create a pixie server in Gen 2 and if anybody out there is good at pixie servers I have made it so that my systems will boot to the pixie server will see it will start up but then I've got errors with it trying to actually grab the file system that it wants to do it I mean it sees it it sees my menu system but then something goes awry and I know nothing about pixie other than the fact that in my work environment I do use pixie on a regular basis to reimage systems that is unfortunately in a Windows Microsoft environment and I am not a part of the team that builds that stuff otherwise I might have a much better insight on it so anybody who knows something about Pixie and Linux and could give me some information or help me out or get with me offline on that I would be most appreciative of that 
So anyway, we go through the introduction here. It talks about how installation is structured. As we will see in step one, you're setting up your environment. Step two, you're creating and setting up your internet connection. Step three, we'll initialize our hard disks. Step four, we're going to create our installation environment and prep everything with ch root, which actually means you're going to go into the minimal system that you've created. In step five, you're going to go ahead and download and install that stage three tarball. In stage six, we're going to pull down a Linux kernel and we're going to compile it. And then afterwards, we're going to configure all our configuration system files, set everything up to customize it for this in stage in step seven. In step eight, we're going to be installing some system tools, some loggers, things like that. And of course, the last thing in step nine is we're going to be creating and installing a bootloader. Now, I'll be using Grub Legacy because I personally just prefer Grub Legacy because I don't really trust things to auto do all the time. I, I know Linux for you and me, Caddy, had mentioned that he likes Grub too because he just does a command and it detects everything and sets it up. I sometimes like to go in there and do my own thing, even if all I am doing is reinventing the wheel. And then in step 10, you've got your system available, you can boot into it, and then you start installing things like a GUI interface if you want it, or other applications to work with the type of environment that you are creating. That sort of outlines what we'll be doing there. Now, and the nice thing about the handbook is, like it says here, what are my options? They go through and they give you, you can do it this way or you can do it that way. This is what's best for this. This is what we suggest you do. And you can take their suggestions or you can look at what the alternatives are. It talks about what the minimum requirements are right here. If we look down, we've already gotten our Gen 2 Minimal CD. You can also look at live DVDs. We're going to be getting the Stage 3 Tarball to install it later. You know, it talks about how to burn it and get it and make sure that all the checksums are proper if you're concerned about that. It talks about booting this installation CD. You know, this is so in-depth. It tells you if you need to put special command lines at the boot, it explains what each of these are. And I'm not going to go into a lot of this because you can see it yourself. And these videos are already going to be very long. So... It talks about extra hardware configuration. You know, for instance, if you're needing to set up your wireless, this is where it's going to show you how you need to do that. Since we're going to be using a virtual environment, a lot of that's already set up. In fact, now that we're logged in here, if we did an if config, we will see that it sees the ENP0S3, which is the wired Ethernet virtualized, and of course your local system. Now that's one thing that I was going to discuss up here. Recently, and I'm not sure actually how recent because within the last three months or so I noticed this, I like to see ETH0, I like to see WLAN0, I'm familiar with that, that makes sense to me. This ENP0S3 makes no sense at all, Makes it just sounds weird. And if you look up here in my little notes, dev names for network controllers can be set proper if you create a link from dev null to etc udev rules.d slash ad-net-name-slot-rules and what that does is upon reboot it renames all that stuff back to what you're familiar with and what makes sense that being eth0 wlan0 i prefer i prefer to see that and i like that much better than this. Now what I have read about that is that evidently in some UDEV issues there have been times when those names have changed after a boot and if you have everything hard-coded to say net.eth0 or net.wlan0 and those names change on you that's gonna screw up a lot of your your setup and your controls. I personally have never run into that and never had an issue at all. 
it, and you see here up here too it's also they haven't even updated this part of their installation even though it's been past this because they're still saying net setup ETH 0 and now you can't do that you have to do a net setup ENP 0 S3 because that's the name of your device right now uh, moving on you know it talks about optional user accounts which really that shouldn't be optional I mean, granted in the beginning here we're going to be using root but you're going to want to make a user at the end of your install because you don't always want to log into any system with root access plus there are a lot of applications out there that forbid you to run them as root because they could do something harmful such as VLC if you try to run it as root it just it just kind of dies on you and you have to do something special to make it run but it warns you that, it, that you shouldn't really do that it talks a little bit about the documentation and and moves on from there so we've booted into the system we're not going to worry about setting up our optional user for now but we are going to make sure that we have an IP address which it automatically did now if you run into other issues for instance if your wireless isn't connecting properly you may have to look for firmware you might have to kind of look into getting the right driver but for the most part Gen 2 has gotten to a point where even with my laptop here and it'll be interesting if in the future if, I, if it's still this way but for the most part the drivers firmware is all available and I haven't run into any problems if we do an ls slash lib slash firmware for instance ah uh, there's nothing there go in there do we have we have we have a lib you just see here so they uh, they haven't put any firmware now if you needed to put firmware for instance and you had the firmware you could create right here a firmware directory and then copy that firmware into it for instance mine requires if we pull up my system here if we look at ls slash lib slash firmware am I doing something oh which I hate that now I swear am I oh bugger it helps if you can spell right right guys now you notice I got a whole bunch of firmware. Now for mine, for instance, it requires this IWL Wi-Fi-6000-4. Now if you're wondering if something's not working because of that, if you do a D message, you can normally see where it's trying to load something. And if it's failing, you're going to see an error in here about the firmware not found or unavailable or not able to load. And it'll tell you pretty much what it's looking for. You can find that in a system that is working, and then you can go ahead and copy it to that lib firmware area. Then you can mod probe the module and bring it in. Now, since we already have everything good right now, what we pretty much want to do is go ahead and set the password for root which we're logged in right now so we're gonna create that password and I'm just gonna do something simple because I don't care if it's a virtual thing it's not gonna be there forever something simple to read so now we've set the root password we could also if you wanted to build this from another location go ahead and start the SSH services so you could secure shell into this and then you could build it from any other computer on your network which sometimes can be very handy if you don't want to be sitting in front of the machine but you want to use a laptop somewhere else in your house to build it to do that all you would need to do is start the services with a slash etc and it dot d ssh start and actually I think that might need a d at the end yeah for the secure shell demon or daemon as some people say and then start and then that's starting your SSH so now 
you should be able to secure shell into it with a command of another machine, ssh, uh, root, at, and then you want to also look at the IP address that it has and be able to then log into it with the password that you set. We're going to go ahead and skip the user ad for now because we're not going to be using it right now. We move on down and this is telling you a link for instance how to get if you needed to get to the handbook on another computer how you can get to that. Lynx is a very good simple tool to use when getting into uh, the internet from the command line interface. There's no GUI to it but it's all text based and gets you in there. And we've already got our network working. We've shown you how if you do an if config if it's all working great then you're good otherwise you can use that net dash setup and then you need to make sure you use the name that it's currently seeing it as not ETH0 for instance but that ENP um, name convention if you have proxies which most people I don't think that's a regular thing if you've got proxies set up you're an advanced enough user you don't need to worry about you know me teaching you that then we move on it talks about how you can test the network to make sure it's working right now mine's not working because as you can see in this lower area here my network shut off again because it's a crummy horrible design with this laptop drives me nuts so if we we're gonna need that network though in a little bit but we'll worry about it later you know, there's the net setup and like I said you need to replace ETH0 with the name of your device if you're using PPP, it gives you information for point-to-point. -point. Uh, that's what I guess for DSL, I believe. We move on. We already have all this. Now, if you need to set up a static IP address, it does teach you how to do that right here. Most people are just going to use DHCP, and that just goes on. See, there's so much information in here. We're not going to be using wireless right now, so we don't need to worry about that. But if you needed to, it's all right here. And we go down into preparing the disks. So we don't need network for that. But if we do an fdisk L, that's going to show us that we have one disk on dev slash SDA and that's 21.5 gigs in size so what we're going to do is fdisk slash dev slash SDA to bring that up now if you ever need help you can hit the M to find out what you can do and L of course will list your partition table styles and I'm sorry I didn't mean a print. No, 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 no. Don't you hate it when you run into a... I wanted just to list what per current partition tables were there. And, you know, I don't use this enough all the time to have all of this memorized, which is why print the partition table. There you go. So you see we have no partition table there. So we need to create a new one. Now, this is where you can decide of a couple different ways to do this. You can either create it with just a swap file and your root partition. Some people will create it with a swap file, a boot partition, and your root partition. Others may create this with a swap, a boot, a home partition, and your root partition. All depending upon how complex you want to get but for this example we're gonna go simple and we're just gonna create two partitions one's gonna be a swap partition one's gonna be a root partition so we're gonna say we want a new partition we want a new primary partition the first one's gonna be default one and then the first sector is gonna be default and we want this root partition to be two gigs now we want a new partition it's going to be a primary partition. It's going to be defaults number two. And we want the default first sector to be the first available. 
and we want the last to be the last, so we just accept it. Now, if we do a print partition table, we'll see that we have SDA1, which we're going to use as a swap, and SDA2, which we're going to use as our main partition. Now, before we can use the first partition as a swap, we need to change the partitioning table. As I hit L before, that shows you all the different partitioning tables that you can choose. And if you look at 82 and 83, you're going to see Linux swap and Linux. So we need to change the partitioning table to be a Linux swap. To change that, you need to look in here and find the change of partition system ID, which is T. We're going to change partition number 1, and we're going to change that to 82. We just double check. And now, if we do a print partition table, we will see that SDA1 is a Linux swap, and SDA2 is regular Linux. Now, that's all we need to do for right now. So we want to write that with a W, which we write to the table. And now, if we were to do an fdisk L, you will see that we have now our partition tables made. We move on, and we need to set them up. So, for instance, here. It's giving you an idea of a default partitioning scheme where it talks about your boot partition, your root partition, your swap partition, etc. But we really don't need a lot of that. It can be as complex or as simple as you need to make it. Now in the swap, what we need to do to make that work, it should be listed right down here. And I'm sorry, there's so much information, you kind of have to weed through it so that you can see this stuff. Oh, creating the BIOS. I've never created a BIOS boot partition. I'm not sure about That's actually something new. They must have inserted in there. But we're going to go on to creating the swap partition. So what we want to do here is get down here to apply in the file systems. There we go. Finally. Okay. So, to create and activate the swap partition, we do the mk swap on dev slash sda1 and then we do swap on slash dev slash sda1 and now we have got the swap partition created and mounted at this time, or at least turned on. The next thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and format SDA2. Now to do that, it shows here in this great table. If you want to do ext4, which is what we're going to do, you're going to use the command mkfs.ext4, or if you want to do ext3 or ext2, you can choose those as well. So mkfs.ext4 slash dev slash sda2. And remember, when you're typing out a command, if you want to speed it up, you can always hit that left tab, and it should go ahead and fill in the rest of the command for you. Or if you're looking for a directory structure, like if you started typing in slash ETC, you hit tab, it's going to fill that on in for you. Something simple to, to hurry up your, your speeding of your typing and all that might help you. So now we've partitioned, we have set up SDA1 as your swap, set up SDA2 as your root, or at least not root yet, it's now been formatted, and we move on to the mounting process in step four. So what we want to do here is we want to mount slash dev slash sda2 because that's our root to slash mount slash gen2 and we want to go ahead and make the directory for slash mount gen2 boot now if you had created a boot partition after you create the Gen2 boot, you would then need to mount the directory, or the, I'm sorry, the partition that you created 
for your boot partition in this. Now since we are going to allow the boot to sit at the root, then we don't need to worry about that. We're going to just go ahead and leave it as it is. Now an important thing when, when doing this, you want to make sure that your date and time are as right on as possible. Otherwise you may get errors with files being in the future and so it's always best now to do the date and make sure that date is proper. If I can, if I can get into the right area here. And we see that it says that it's Tuesday, Thursday, December 19th. It's 2015 16, that's UTC time. Uh, for now, we're just going to leave it UTC. But if if you wanted to change that then you'll see that the format is date month day then hour minute and year and for now we're gonna just leave it as UTC because it also doesn't tell you right here how to change that to local that's something you can do at the end of the process but it's important to make sure that you keep that all good for now Oh, I'm going to go ahead and do that date change anyway because it's going to bug me that it's not right. So month would be 12, day would be 19, hour would be 13, minute 16, and it is 2013. So there, even though it says it's UTC, that's fine. It's got my right date and time and we move on and this is where we need to make sure we have internet so that we can go ahead and get the stage 3 tarball so we lo we mount we change into the mount gen 2 directory and then i need to make sure i get my wireless working again so let me pull into here and while i do that i'm going to pause and it looks like we've been going for about 32 minutes Okay, I got my internet working, but I did notice that this video has gotten up to 32 minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the video here. We're going to start part two with downloading and setting up the next section with the tarball from the internet, and we'll move on. And as I said too, this tutorial is going to be pretty much, I'm going through the handbook with you to teach you as much as I can at the end of everything and once we have the system set I may wipe it and we'll do a down and dirty quick install guide with the other one that should be a lot faster but if you really want to learn as much as I can and hopefully don't stumble too much over this please continue to watch these because they're gonna I'm gonna be talking a lot about what the handbook has in there and it's such a great resource so until part two thanks for watching if it's morning, evening, noon, or night, whatever you're having, enjoy it. Thanks a lot. Bye.